Uh, as it was mentioned, I'm also a lecturer here at Hwasan University in the Faculty of Design and Art. And it's always interesting to get the first class after lunch or after break, so uh, I empathize with you. Today I'm going to be speaking um, sort of about a, a notion that I've had that I've found recurring in my life, um, and that is called uh, hybridity. Go to the next slide. Please. We had a, I'm not controlling the slides tonight, so we're going to work in tandem to move the slides along. So what is hybridity or what is a hybrid? A hybrid is a combination or a mating of two separate species um, or plants or animals, but it can also extend to culture as well. Um, we see hybridity um, all throughout our reality, um, whether it's unique cuisines like fusion cuisine, where we find them in the digital blended real world, such as augmented reality. So I began to think that hybridity probably had something more to say to us as we started to find it in different places and different moments in our lives. Um, next slide, please. And I wanted to try to connect that um, to our current very strange challenging situation, which is the new normal situation that we're living in now, or in Dunmai. And um, I'm not sure I'm going to be successful, but I wanted to um, share some examples of hybrids that I had found interesting, and eventually try to connect that to maybe a, maybe strategies to, to focus of a word, but maybe a, a guide for us to move forward during this time period. Okay, next slide. So if you can see behind me, um, this is actually a hybrid. Um, it is called a roller bear. And some of you might suspect the roller actually is a combination of grizzly bear and polar bear. How did these hybrids come about? Well, they're also under the same stressful condition that we're under some, in some ways. Because of climate change, um, the rapid deterioration of the, of the environment of the polar bear has forced it down south and in contact with grizzly bears. Now, this isn't the first time. This has happened across bear mating. This happened since the Pleistocene period. But in our period, we're finding that pressures, environmental pressures, are bringing different species together and creating entirely new beings. Look at the next one. This is also a hybrid, but this doesn't occur naturally. This is called a beefalo. A beefalo is the combination of domestic cattle, cows, and um, American bison, or buffalo. And the thought was that you could improve milk production through the cattle part, but because of the robust, tough um, resilience of the buffalo on the plains, they also live longer. Okay. And the last example, which is usually the first pe one people come up with, is called the liger. It's the combination of a tiger and a lion. Um, okay, next one. We as humans seem to have the tendency to naturally put together things that don't naturally go together. Um, almost all cultures um, around the world, I have two examples behind me, one from the east and one from the west. We have this creative impulse to bring together the familiar and the strange. The familiar part of these is obviously the human part, us. And the strange would be our attachment to the other, the animal. On the left-hand side, oops, we'll go back one slide. On the left-hand slide, on the left, this is called a genery. Um, this mythological creature is half human and half bird. It recurs throughout Hindu, Buddhist, and Southeast Asian art and folklore. Um, and, on the, and on the right side, we have the Triton Sea creature at the center, which is actually three beings. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, in the 20th century, uh, a group of artists called the Surrealists um, emerged. 
heavily influenced by new ideas at that time period, which included psychoanalysis. And a part of psychoanalysis was also really an, a strong interest in the dream state. And this is where um, an emergence of dream analysis also started to gain currency uh, in the public. But the Surrealists had a very interesting game. What they would do is they would take a sheet of paper and they would fold it like a zigzag in sections. And then they would pass this paper along to maybe five or six or four artists. Each artist would draw on one section, fold it over, hiding their drawing, and the next artist would draw theirs. And after everyone drew their section, they would unfurl the paper to create this hideous, really creative hybrid. And this is called the exquisite corpse. If you Google it, you'll find children are doing this um, in school as a, a practice for, for creativity. Um, next slide, please. But perhaps the most malleable and most flexible hybrid of all is language itself. Um, language, uh, if you're a linguist or you're studying the history of language, we know that language um, is really an amazing thing. We borrow words, we change the context. There's so many things that we can do with this abstraction of language. And I'm going to show you a few examples. Okay, next. There is a very specific linguistic term called the portmanteau. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And that is taking a fragment of one word, um, and a fragment of another word, and mashing them together. Uh, for example, we have the roller bear, which I've showed you before, or the other example is bromance, sort of the fuzzy feeling between guys. Um, but bromance, in fact, is, in, is kind of a modern portmanteau. Um, it was preceded hundreds of years before that by another term which means exactly the same thing, which is also a portmanteau, which is called the city of Philadelphia, which is the city of brotherly love. Okay, next one. Now, um, I was born in Vietnam uh, many, many years ago, and I'm an adoptee, therefore that's how I have this sort of hybrid name, which is Street Matter John. And so I arrived here tw almost 20 years ago, um, having spoken no Vietnamese. And as we all are mostly bilingual speakers or trilingual speakers, we have to process all that new information under our own terms. And in my way of doing it, I would take an example such as here, um, two words to look at something, to see something, one um, maybe from the north and one more of a local dialect. And in order to create a mnemonic, something to help me remember to recall these words, you would, I would use the same strategies. Not the portmanteau, but something called an anagram. Where you take all the letters and see how many variations you can get. And from that, I get the next word, which is Mexico, which is something that is easy for me to recall and easy for me to, to um, well, it's easy for me to learn the language by making these games. Now, I have children, uh, like many of the other speakers, um, my daughter is 10, and um, we often play these games of creating new words. Another example is Jinsak, and exactly, they both seem to have that XAC. So now in our household, we try to use these as much as possible, and we arrive at Jinsakly. So we use these words as hybrids, um, and we always try to make up new ones. Um, but I'm not a linguist, I am an artist, and so when thinking about what to speak tonight, um, of course I wanted to include my artwork, but I needed to attach that to this thing called the hybrid. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to be successful, but let's go to the next slide. So we're going to be talking about art and creativity. Art and creativity has been mentioned already. Um, I tend to think that um, creativity is a very personal thing. Um, as other speakers have mentioned, there's no real way to define it. Um, but let me show you some works where I think are examples where I can bring things together that don't obviously fit together. So let's go to the next slide. This you'll see downstairs in a slightly different configuration. I've always loved history and science. Um, I never became a scientist because I can't do math, 
But one thing that I love is the study of materials, or materiality, or material histories. And um, in this piece behind me, um, I love the Hindu Buddhist Southeast Asian art aesthetic. Um, and so in Vietnam, as we know, um, much of the southern part of Vietnam uh, for many for many centuries um, was occupied by the Chum people. And for many years I've been looking at works and sculpture by the, this culture, but I wanted to figure out my own relation to it. Um, now, I visited the Sculpture Museum um, of Chum Sculpture in Da Nang, and um, these pieces are made in sandstone. They're absolutely exquisite. They're heavy. Um, they're gorgeous. Um, but I wanted to say, what do I today have to say about my own interest? So I wanted to kind of do the opposite. Um, so I took a, the general form of something that I saw in the museum and used a material that was not heavy at all. In fact, this is almost, I think, two meters high, but two people could easily pick this up. It's made out of foam. Um, go to the next one, please. On the other hand, I made this in 2008 for the Singapore Biennale, Biennale, Biennale. and um, this, can anybody guess what this material might be? It looks like marble, but it's actually sugar, or dough. It's six tons of sugar, um, and you, you could eat it. In fact, it was occupied, it became like the nirvana of honeybees, uh, for three months until it melted away in the public space of Singapore. Okay, next one. Um, I think in 2012, something around there, I started making these very fragile skulls. Um, they were inspired by a visit that I had uh, many years ago in Cambodia. I'm looking at the S21 uh, tool sling prison. Um, these um, maybe look like plastic or resin, but they're also they're all made out of banjang. Basically, we all we're all familiar with this cheap, this material. You dip it in water, in a few seconds, it becomes nice and soft, and then if you don't eat it quick enough, it becomes hard again. So all you need to do is dip it, form it, let it dry, and it's good. And the bonus of this material, it's like a perfect sculpture material. It doesn't rot. It doesn't grow mold. The only enemy, the only kryptonite, if we're talking Superman terms, is water. You're just going to have a moist environment. Can we go to the next one? Here's a close-up, you can see, of uh, these skulls. And the beauty of them, of this banjang material, is when it's wet, it almost feels like skin. Like a wet skin. Maybe if you were in a hospital and you got burnt and you needed like a skin plasma, it's, it's sort of like that. And then when it's slightly drier, it can still bend, like the cartilage in your ear. But when it's fully dry, it's like bone. So Banjang emulates all states of the human body. Okay, next. Um, this, however, is a traditional material. This is um, the same clay that you'll see downstairs on the sculpture. It's the modeling clay, the very same modeling clay that you can buy at the bookstore here. Um, I love to do um, not only architectural works, but I'm a big fan of figurative work. So I do a lot of drawing and painting and sculpture um, based on observation of humans. Um, but the next slide, this is not modeling clay. This is chocolate cake, um, also edible. But the materials look the same. So I'm always interested in what we believe something is, and what we know something to be, or that space in between, the unknown area. Might that be? Okay, next. Okay, uh, so I want to talk about how we quickly perceive our world. And of course that is through the senses. Um, depending on who you ask, we have five senses. And we see sight, hearing, taste, touch, and a missing one. It's like hearing smell. Smell. Um, so we experience 
our world, we perceive our world through these, these inputs. Um, not everybody has agreed um, on these only five senses. And sometimes these senses in very unique people, they seem to be cross-wired, meaning that an input from one sense actually outputs through another sense. So what, what is an example of that? The painter Kandinsky um, was said to be able to see sound. So when, he, when he heard music, somehow in his brain, he would start to see colors, and then he would translate those colors on the paintings. Other people have other senses. Some people could, you could hit the key of D, and they have a sour taste in their mouth. But you do a C, and it's very, it's very salty. These are very unique people. The Greeks, well, let's go to the next slide. Um, the ancient Greeks um, had a different sort of way of understanding the senses. They thought that hearing, seeing, and smelling were all distinct because you needed to do them from a distance. However, they believed that there was no distinction between the senses that we have now of touch and taste. Why? Because in order to get information about something, you have to be in contact with it. So whether it's your hand, this is hot, or your tongue, this is spicy, they said, what's the difference? You have to touch it in order to get the input. So that's how the Greeks thought about the senses. Okay, um, next. So we're still talking about flavor and senses. Even sometimes the way that we describe things are a combination, they're actually hybrid senses. Taste is actually the combination of these two. Next slide. Smell and taste. You can, you can test this yourself. You can go home, take one of your favorite dishes, hold your nose, and then eat it. The flavor will be entirely different. Um, unfortunately, um, let's go to the next slide. We are living in this time. And um, two months ago, my family and I were all F0 including my one-year-old son. And um, I didn't know it at first, but then that typical symptom hit me. I lost my smell. And, I, and, and as a result, next slide please, the home meals, because everything was cooked at home at this time period, all the home meals suddenly lost their appeal, um, next slide, um, because I, I was suffering from the infection from the virus. Okay, next slide. Um, let's see if I want to say one more thing before this. Um, hybridity is a taking or a taking of the familiar or the strange or the, um, the known and the unknown. It's, it, it's, a, it's sort of a process of your own way of making the new. And it's all over the world. Um, but if you realize that hybridity is everywhere we look, then we find the potential in seeing that the combinations and the choices that we make can actually redefine you and also redefine the reality for others. So, let me, I'm trying to, I, I didn't know if I was going to be successful in tying this together with a new normal, but this particular time period that we're living in now um, will force us to find new relations and friends, family, colleagues, and ultimately yourself. And if you take this approach to say, there's no problem that these don't go together, I'll take a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, push them together, and you might come up with the next hybrid. Unicorn is a hybrid, but a unicorn is also a very trendy term for creating the next billion dollar startup. So good luck to you, all keep safe, and um, make your own combinations. Thank you very much.